Thank you, everyone, for coming. We are grateful for your attendance. Uh, before we get underway, I would like all of us to honor our colleague, Jason Rezaian of the Washington Post, who remains unjustly imprisoned in Iran. Jason is represented here tonight by his brother Ali, his sister-in-law, Naomi, and his lawyers at the Post and the Wilmer Hale Firm. Let's have a moment of silence for Jason in honor of his courage. We stand in solidarity with Jason and the Post, and we pledge to do anything we can to help bring him home safely. As we mark our 45th anniversary trying to protect the rights of journalists, I can think of no more important discussion. Today, I'm not in my role of ABC News Senior Justice Correspondent, but as the chair of the Reporters Committee. I'm hoping it will be a frank discussion where a lot of questions can be answered, and I'm hoping at the end of the dialogue, we can continue to push toward the day when journalists in our, in our profession, no journalist is under pressure to reveal their sources. Mr. Holder, thank you so much for agreeing to talk. Let's get right to it. If you have some thoughts before we get started. Uh, well, just one. Uh, Isakov has to be thrown out before I'll say anything. <laughs> I did not sign up for that, okay? <laughs> All right, well... I'm not uh, kidding. I want to remove. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to support my brethren already, so please stay, Mr. Isikoff. Um, let's get right to it. Did the department consider the chilling effect that pursuing source information from reporters could have on a newsroom and on our profession? What precisely was the attitude of some of the prosecutors? Was there any sensitivity... Or was the thinking something sensitive got leaked and we need to find out about it by any means necessary? Well, I mean, I think, you know, the department works in a, in a, in a few, way, few ways and at a, a few levels. Um, if you're a, a line person, as I was in the, uh, at the Justice Department, um, though never handling, you know, that kind of case, you're primarily concerned with um, proving your case, um, you know, winning at trial. And it's not... Um, as if you don't take into account other things that um, are important. But that's, that's your primary focus. As you go up the, the chain, and there's certain hope as you get to the Attorney General, you have people who should be taking into account um, a whole variety of things beyond just um, the winning of the case, whatever that happens to be. Uh, there are policy issues that you have to, um, have to take into account. And I hope that... Um, that's something that we did in the administration. hope that's something that we did in the department while I was there. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about it later on, but certainly there were a few things that I thought needed to be, I'd say, tweaked, changed, modified um, in order to make sure that we had a system in place so that line-level um, enthusiasm was tempered by you know, upper-level um, policy considerations. Okay, let's take the AP case and the phone records that you sought from a court and got. Uh, and just so everybody understands, yeah, and I'll, we'll, I'll answer that as best I can. I was recused in that case, and now I'll, I'll tell everybody why. Um, I was, uh, at the time frame that was at issue, I was actually talking, they pulled phone records and saw that I was talking to a, uh, a reporter. You, sorry. Uh, you, you she never knew that. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, interesting and to so, find out. So as a result, um, not only I, but I think Bob Mueller, I think, was also recused. I don't know, some, a number of us at high levels were recused in that case. So I, that's, that's, remember I told you I was going to tell you about this? Well, I've now told you why. That was the thing. So talking to her got me. I, so I was never involved in the, um, the decision-making in that case. So I'm, I'm obviously familiar, you know, with it. Okay. And I want to couple that with the pursuit of James Rosen's emails at Fox News. The question is, did anyone at the department consider the long-term impact on news gathering? Now, what I wanted you to do is put yourself in the position of being in the newsroom. The government knowing who the reporters were talking to, who they were emailing, how if you were a source you might be reluctant to call the AP, how tips might dry up, and 
question, why were so many phone lines affected? So just give us a sense of how a decision like that gets made to do something as, in our field, we would think as severe as getting the phone records of working journalists. Yeah. Well, um, again, you're, the focus you have to understand is not on going after a reporter per se. It is really about trying to figure out who is the, the leak. This is what we're talking about, national security leaks here. Uh, who's the, the leaker? Um, how do you prove that up? And if you have a typical criminal case, um, you know, and some person is talking about um, malfeasance, something or other that's, that's purely criminal in nature, not a, a leak necessarily, you can use the grand jury to kind of go at that and kind of go at it this way. But if you're talking about a leak, then it's, you know, a leaker speaking directly to a reporter and sharing information that is contrary to what the, um, the public official who has taken an oath is supposed to do. You know, that leads the Justice Department, the prosecutor, um, into areas that I know are going to be uncomfortable for um, you all. And so but in answer to your question, is that something that's taken into account? Yeah, I mean, that is taken into consideration. There are a whole series of regulations that um, kind of uh, regulate the way in which these investigations are supposed to occur, um, how you're supposed to use um, the tools that you have at the Justice Department. Um, and those tools and those regulations were, as I said, modified after um, I think some legitimate concerns were raised about, um, you know, the Rosen matter and, uh, you know, the AP case. Um, though I will have to say that, you know, uh, some of the stuff, and I'm going to, we're just being frank here, some of the stuff I think was a little overblown. And I, I just, I brought with me here just a, just a couple of things. Um, President Obama, I'm quoting now, President Obama hates the press. Another quote, greatest enemy to press freedom in a generation, more dangerous to the press than any White House, other White House in history. Holder's dark legacy. Uh, <laughs> and then somebody argued that the Obama administration had been worse than Nixon. Um, so, so you think about that. And these are, I'm not identifying the people who said these things, but they're very, you know, these are reputable people who I, who loved, I love to listen to and read, um, or I used to, um, <laughs> especially the Holder dark legacy thing. Um, but there is a... There, is a, there has to be a sensitivity, I think, on the part of those people in government. But at the same time, I think there has to be a sensitivity on the part of the media to understand that um, this is part of the job that, um, I'll say we, that we have to do uh, in order to protect the national security. But all, with all due respect, though, in the case of AP, there was no attempt to uh, alert AP, uh, so that they could make their case before a judge uh, to narrow the scope of what the government was pursuing, mm -hmm. and should that have been done? And you see, that actually is one of the things that when we put that group together that um, met with us, and I was really struck. We had, I think, I, I think I participated personally in seven meetings with a group, you know, variety of people uh, from the media, and the uh, the constant theme was a lack of notice um, that there was not the opportunity to. Uh, go to a judge or have a meeting to talk about ways in which um, these requests might in some ways be tailored, narrowed. Um, and that's why we dialed into the, um, the modifications, the presumption that notice should be given, kind of reversing the presumption that, uh, as it existed before, that no notice should be given to uh, the notion that notice should be given unless determinations are made by high-level people within the department and, and um, that it should not occur. And, and the reason I'm, I'm raising this, uh, because again, I'm not just a journalist tonight, I'm an advocate. As you say, the government has its interests and there's a natural tension between what we're doing and what you're doing. But our job is to find out what government is doing. Mm -hmm. um, and so the pressure that was put on these people for basically doing their job um, and the chilling effect, again, on the ability Imagine being an AP during that, po that point when you find out your records have been reviewed by the government. Uh, that is a very serious event in sure. journalism, and I can tell you it reverberated across our field. Um, on the question of Rosen, I'm quoting you. You said that the application for the search warrant could have been differently 
done differently or better. Quote, I think I could have been a little bit more careful looking at the language that was contained in the filing that we made with the court and that he was labeled as a co-conspirator. Was your regret over the language or the fact that DOJ seized his emails? Well, I, certainly about the language. We'll start there. Um, the way in which it was formulated um, really kind of tracked the statute um, and tried to, I think the people who put it together were trying to um, meet the statutory requirements. And that necessarily involved the use of language that um, could have been a little more, done a little more sensitively. Um, with regard to... In terms of calling him a co-conspirator. Yeah. I mean, there, there could have been a better way to do that. I don't, off the top of my head, you know, I'm sure we, lawyers, we could come up, you know, you could have done it, could have done it differently. Um, and still gotten, you know, past the, the necessary legal, um, legal hurdle. Um, with regard to, you know, getting the materials, um, I, I can't. I honestly don't remember all the, you know, the facts there. Um, but I, as I remember, I think there was a good basis for um, making the requests. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, in terms, I think, I, I think that, I, I think I was pretty comfortable in terms of, you know, what we were, what we were, were, were seeking. A more generic question: Given all the powers and the authorities that the Department of Justice has. Weren't there other mechanisms to try to get to who the leaker was rather than putting the pressure directly on the reporter? Yeah, I mean, there again, you know, the regulations say you have to exhaust all the other ways in which you're trying to get this information before you take um, these, these kinds of steps. And I think that is an appropriate thing. But I think at some point, you know, we have to understand, I mean, for whatever number of things that we did at the Justice Department. And I think we also, you know, one of the things that gets me, I, I read these stories about how this is the administration that has done more of these things than any other administration or double the number there before. Well, the reality is that we did a total of seven. Um, and as I look at them, as best I can figure, uh, two of those we were gifted from the, the prior administration. Um, so we did about seven, potentially eight. Uh, and so I, that, I think, is something we need to keep in, in, in some kind of perspectives here. This wasn't something we were doing on a weekly, on a weekly basis, even though the numbers, I mean, that, what the statement is, is factually correct, that we did more than any other administration. Um, now, I forgot, what was, what was the... <laughs> other tools, other ways to get at what you're seeking. Yeah, I mean, again, we, you have to go through all the other ways in which you can... Um, you know, get this information before you get to the, the kinds of things that I think raise the greatest amount of concern. But, you know, I, I think there has to be an understanding on both sides. Um, I certainly tried to understand better, and I think the meetings that we had um, with, you know, with, with this group uh, sensitized me and I think people in the department to, um, in a way that we had not been sensitized before. To hear th that, that, that theme about notice was really something that I, kind of struck me. At the end, I guess, when we put out that first uh, work product, we had that thing we talked about, ordinary news gathering. And everybody came back and said, you got to drop ordinary. And I thought, wow, from my perspective, um, I thought that was more protective than, you know, just, just news gathering. But I deferred, we ultimately deferred to, deferred to the folks in, in the media and took, and took that out. Um, but... Again, trying to understand the roles, you know, uh, we need to be more sensitive. But I think people in the media have to be sensitive as well to the responsibility that we have uh, to, you know, deal with these national security issues. And I think the question is, be just because we have the ability to do certain things, as President Obama says, just because we have the ability to do certain things doesn't mean we should do them, you know, just because we have that, that ability. And I think that's something that I tried to instill in, in the folks at, uh, at DOJ as we confronted these issues. But I think the press has to ask that, that, that same question. Um, I mean, if you all were to come into possession of information, this is unfair, but, you know, I'll be unfair, um, in the middle of World War II about the existence of the Manhattan Project, is that something that you think you would have, you know, written about? Um, now, that's obviously an extreme unfair example. But, and I assume people here would all say no, but I don't know. Would anybody think that you would publish something about the Manhattan Project? Okay. Um, so we're on. We, so, all right, well, that would be, that's another one. That was published? 
And I would. Guys in the Justice Department were going to prosecute until it turned out that the Japanese didn't believe how they did. But, you know, that would have been my other example. I was going to go with Enigma and, you know, the, the German code. I mean, would that be something that would be published? And I would think that that in some ways I would think would be irresponsible, you know. Um, again, you have the ability to do it, um, mm -hmm. but the question is, is something that you, you should do? Um, in that case that we brought, I guess the AP case, you know, um, where we were talking about getting close to, you know, a person who had done harm to our nation and probably still out there now, you know, gonna, trying to make bombs and all. That's another one of those ones, that, you know, yeah, you got it and you can publish it, but should you, should you do it? And again, this is not for the government, this is not for the government to decide. This is something I think that you all have to decide, but I think it's a question that um, people in the media should ask themselves. So what I hear you saying is if you publish something sensitive enough, all bets are off? No, uh-uh, no. I mean, you know, you understand, you have to understand that we got, if we brought seven cases, whatever the number is, we had way more referrals than that from people in the, on the intelligence agencies um, that we turned away um, and said, no, we're not, we're not going to do that. Um, and I got calls from, you know, my counterparts at, at CIA, um, ODNI, to say, you know, what do you, what do you mean you're not doing this? And we decided, you know, for a variety of reasons, these were just cases that we weren't going to, uh, weren't going to investigate. It's also one of the changes that we made in the, um, in the guidelines that requires, a, you know, a certification, in essence, from the person or from the organization that's sending the thing to us to try just to knock down the number of things that we uh, had to consider. Now, I, I'm a, I want to turn to the dialogue that you had to, with the reporters and the lawyers re representing the free press in, in a moment and get into the evolution of how those conversations went and what you ended up with. But I want to get to one last specific, though. Um, and again, part of what I want to do is sensitize you uh, to what it means to be in a position of a reporter going through this. Um, I have never received a government subpoena, thank God, to reveal who my sources are. But I have been the subject of a subpoena to reveal my sources. And I can recall the conversation I had with my wife one night over dinner in which I told her that going to jail was a very real possibility and that I might be fine to the point where we might be ruined because the judge was making it pretty clear that she was not going to allow the company to pay said fine, that I would be re responsible for the fine. So others like James Rison of the New York Times have gone through worse facing month after month of worry. Um, it's not just professional, the families go through it as well. Uh, in the case of Ryzen, DOJ appealed <coughs> a decision after a, uh, a judge said that the reporter's testimony was unnecessary and quashed your department's subpoena. Why did you continue to pursue it after the judge quashed the subpoena? Well, as I remember, I, we made the determination that uh, the testimony was, in fact, necessary. Again, focusing, I don't I have to look at the timeline, because mm -hmm. I got involved in that case in a real serious way towards the end, um, or maybe a little after half, the halfway point, um, and got really personally involved in, uh, in, in that matter. But I, I guess, you know, the, the thought was that, you know, um, in order to make the case that his testimony was going to be necessary, though I think it, the important, so that's, that's an important point, mm -hmm. but I think the outcome of that matter is, uh, is equally important, that, you know, we made a determination that um, we had, we really restricted what we needed to get from him that I didn't think um, uh, caused him to do any of the kinds of things that are of greatest concern to people in the media, that is the, the revelation of sources, but there was other information that he could share, could have shared, and did share that was that was useful uh, and necessary for us to make the case. And I really pushed, you know, the prosecutors to come up with a way in which that um, that could be that could be done. Ultimately, you didn't force him to go all the way, right. but in hindsight, the threat of fines, the threat of jail time potentially, was still on the table. 
Is there anything about that process you would have changed? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, given where we are now and given the regulations that are in place, given the experience we had there, I think we would have gotten to the, the position that we ultimately, ultimately were in, um, gotten to that position, you know, a lot sooner um, and, and not have dragged it out. Though I have to say, you know, the judge in that case who started with me on the same day at the public integrity section back in 1976, uh, Dee Brinkema, Judge Brinkema, um, I got to say, you know, I love her to death. Um, she's a former colleague, but I think she stretched that out a, a little, you know. That went on for, like, forever, and up and down, up and down. Um, so I think in a whole bunch of different ways, um, that whole process could have been short-circuited, um, could have been done better, um, and not, wouldn't, shouldn't have taken as much time. And have been, you know, less disruptive, um, for, you know, for, for the reporter. I mean, because, I, I, you know, I get that. I mean, I, I understand what you're saying. I've actually testified in, uh, you know, a grand jury proceeding. Um, so I understand what, you know, and had a lawyer. Um, so I understand what that's, that's about. That, that ain't fun, you know. It's, um, it's one thing when you just kind of, you, you know, the, you're the prosecutor and you're working on the stuff the night before. It's a whole different deal. You've got a grand jury subpoena, and you want to make sure that everything you say is right and, you know, think about false statements, perjury, and, you know, whatever else. Um, so I, the point that you make is, is well taken. But I think that um, given the same set of facts now, that that process would have been, I think, truncated, um, and we'd have gotten to what I think was an appropriate resolution um, a lot sooner. One thing I think a lot of people here are curious about is how do leak invest investigations typically get launched? Is the pressure coming from the affected agency, the White House, or within the bowels of DOJ? Well, I can, I, I can honestly say it's never coming from the White House. Um, you, know, they, you know, White House branding and raving about leaks all the time, but there's like, you know, like what's the day, what's the leak, what's the agency? You know, that's so, not that we don't listen to them or hear them, because, well, I'm not in the administration. <laughs> yeah, no. So, yeah, but the, um, more often than not, they're coming from the intelligence community. I mean, we're, given well, I mean, the national security leaks that we're talking about, it comes from the intelligence community. Um, you know, leaks of policy that are related to HUD or energy, I mean, you know, important stuff, but that's, you know, no one's thinking about that kind of stuff. And so they basically will come from, um, from the intelligence community. I mean, you know, rarely you'll have somebody within justice say, well, this is, a, this is a really bad leak. We need, to, we need to look into that. But even if that comes from justice, there is always a, some kind of interaction with the intelligence community to say, you know, is this as serious as it seems to be? Um, it, so it really is kind of on them either to confirm what is thought to be serious in the department or to initiate it in the, in the first instance. And, and how does it work its way up the food chain to the point where someone like you has to make a decision of whether to go for it or not? It's only the, when it gets problematic does the AG get involved if everything's going smoothly? I mean, you've got to understand, there are lots of subpoenas that go out um, to reporters where things are worked out at the line level um, that an attorney general, deputy attorney general, um, doesn't really hear much about. You might, you might see things or you have, might have to sign things, but it's really kind of pro forma. Um, you know, the memo that you get says we worked our way through this. The reporter just wants a subpoena um, but is willing to share, you know, the information, whatever the information sought is. Um, but the really dicey ones um, are the ones that work their way up um, to the AG, and then you end up with uh, sitting around the conference table in the fifth floor, and those are the ones that, um, those are the least favorite meetings that I probably had as Attorney General. And why is that? Because, I mean, you all might not believe this, but I got it, you know, the, the notion that um, the impact, you know, It bothered me when we were in a position where we were going to have to be in an antagonistic position with the media. You know, it's just not, it wasn't for me a comfortable place, you know. Um, I was always seeking ways, well, what about this? I mean, do you need that much? I mean, have you talked to their lawyers? Is there some way that we can, you know, figure out a way to do this? Um, it just wasn't. It's just not how I'm wound. And, um... But ultimately, you're, there are people in my profession that think that you were aggressive and maybe perhaps too much so. 
Yeah, no, I understand that. Um, and that's why I was talking about the numbers before, you know, um, given the abilities that um, you now have in terms of electronic material that is, is available now that wasn't even 10, I don't know, 15, 20 years or so ago, given the post 9 11 um, environment in which we operate. Um, I think we're dealing with in an area, in an environment that's really kind of fundamentally different from that which existed before. I want to turn to the dialogue that you had with reporters and members of the legal community helping us uh, to deal with some of the things you were doing. Give us a sense of where you started in that dialogue and where you ended up being at the end of the process. That was a really interesting process. Um, Margaret Richardson, she's uh, my chief of staff, and I, she can say that, I, I, I'm, sure to, I'm sure you would agree with me that after these meetings, we would say to one, Jim Cole was there with me, who was the deputy attorney general, we'd say, did you know that? And say, no, I didn't know that. And, and there was always some nugget or a few nuggets that would come out of those meetings where you go, wow, well, that was interesting. Now, we would, you know, we had our DOJ litigated faces on as we were interacting with the people we were talking to. Um, but the notice thing was something that really um, I don't think we necessarily expected to hear as, um, as stridently as we did. Um, I remember one meeting when some we were talking, people said, we were saying, well, what do you do with the records that you get? So, you know, some leaker or, you know, is giving you this stuff, and what do you do with them? I mean, how, 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 you know, and we're thinking from the Justice Department's perspective, well, we put them in the, um, in the safe at the Washington Post or something like that. And I remember this reporter or whoever was saying, said, well, I just leave it in the trunk of my car, you know. Um, and I was like, what? You know, we're talking about top secret whatever, and you just leave it in the trunk of your car? Um, and, but again, you know, we said, oh, yeah, that's interesting. And then they leave, and we're like, did you hear what she said about the, you know? And right, right. Leaving. So, I mean, again, little nuggets like that. Um, but I guess also what, I, what struck me was that there seemed to be a real desire to kind of work through these issues, um, that people were not as... Um, there was a greater degree of flexibility um, there than I expected to, to hear. And as I listened to folks in the, the media express their concerns, um, and I think it was everybody on our side of the table felt pretty much the same, that um, by and large the, the concerns that were being raised were reasonable ones and things that we could, you know, somehow, we could somehow deal with. Can you give us a sense of before with the guidelines and after some of the key things that are different now as opposed to when you started the process? Well, you know, I think the biggest thing is notice. I mean, I, I think that matters um, in a really fundamental way um, because it allows news organizations to, um, to challenge things that, you know, align lawyerism, you know, unfair. The Justice Department has decided, you know, that it wants to do. It gives a, it's a way in which dialogue can be, can be opened up and hopefully keeps, you know, the temperature, the, the, the temperature down. Um, that whole question of ordinary news gathering as opposed to just news gathering, I mean, that was, I think, you know, pretty significant. Elevating the level at which um, um, uh, approvals have to be made, you know, to kick them up so that you actually have the attorney general, the deputy attorney general actually signing off on them. The formation of the, that, uh, we call it the committee, I don't remember what the technical term was, where we have uh, people from the media meeting on a periodic basis with people in the department so that as these new regulations were rolled out, we can kind of do checks to see, you know, well, how are we, how are we doing here? Um, and then the formation of a, a group within the, the Justice Department to kind of monitor how the department itself feels it's, um, it's doing. I mean, all these things are, are new um, and I think are, um, are good. And then the memos that went out to the field that essentially said, you know, all right, here's the deal, guys. We're going to do this in a different way. And I hope, I hope that that um, sensitized the, uh, the people at the line level so that um, they will keep that in mind as they're trying to formulate their um, requests. How much resistance did you face from people to say, hey, our job is to get this doggone information and, you know, uh, who cares about how uncomfortable we make them? We want to make them uncomfortable so that the leaks stop. I'm not sure people go so far as to say we want to make them uncomfortable. Um, on the other hand, yeah, you did hear there was that opposition to, you know, this notion of, well, wait a minute, we're just doing our jobs here, you know, and, you know, all the law is on our side. Supreme Court's ruled about the existence or non-existence of a privilege. Um, we're giving up too much here. Um, but it seems to me that, um, and it seemed to me then and it seems to me now, that there is 
you know, there's a balance that has to be struck. It's, I think the tension is actually a pretty good one um, because it means that um, the government is acting in appropriate ways if it is sensitive and dealing with, um, and sometimes, you know, a, a confrontational basis. And I would hope that on the other side, um, that the media is maybe a little more, well, sensitized to aware of um, the concerns that we have in the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the government side. I, I mean, I hope that, you know, those meetings, that there was a good exchange of, uh, of views. Do you believe that too much information is classified and therefore results in leak investigations? Absolutely. We overclassify. I mean, I looked at stuff I would see that was top secret, and I'd say, well, wait a minute, I just, you know, I just read about this stuff in the paper yesterday. You know, what, I mean, so, I mean, how, how, can, how can this be, um, that's my girl by the temptations. That would mean to see the, one of my two daughters. Um, um, but yeah, we overclassify stuff. What, there's, there, there are way too many things that are, um, I would say, non-consequential, that for some reason, somebody at some place um, has slapped a, um, a top secret sticker on, a confidential sticker on, and you look like, really? I mean, you know, this is something I could... I could throw out of the fifth floor of the Justice Department and be no harm to anybody. No, so yeah. And for the record, are you in favor of a reporter's privilege? Yeah, I mean, um, well, shield law is something that I certainly, um, you know, think is. Uh, I testified about that during my confirmation hearing. Um, something every time I was asked, I you know testified in in, in favor of. Um, and uh, you know. Uh, I would hope that at some point, um, you know, that will be will, that will become law. And just a few uh, policy questions before we wrap up. And again, I thank you for your time, and thanks everyone for being so patient. I've been just trying to work through some of these issues that I think many of us have been thinking about. Should the government look for another way to police unauthorized leaks rather than through the Espionage Act? Are there other solutions? Well, you know, the Espionage Act. It's you know, it's interesting. Um, there are certain, they're charged, a certain charge, well, you all are, you know, are wordsmiths, and when people hear the Espionage Act, like, oh, oh, you know, it's... Um, I do. I feel like that. <laughs> <laughs> but from my perspective, it just happens to be, that just happens to be the place where, where the, there is the statutory basis to do the investigations that we're doing. I mean, if you could change the Espionage Act to the Unauthorized Disclosure of Information Act, you know, it would be, um, it would not, I think, resonate in the minds of, uh, of, you know, the general public. Perhaps not have, you know, it would not have the same calming effect on people in, in, in the media, but to hear, you know, oh, you brought all these cases under the Espionage Act, Holder. You know, like, yeah, the Espionage Act, okay, but, you know, it's kind of, that's just the title of, of the damn thing. Um, is there a, would, 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 but it's not like we were saying that people were engaged in, Espionage, you know. I mean, it's, it's, it, it was really a, a part of the uh, the Espionage Act that had to do with the unauthorized disclosure of material. But as you say, words do matter, and that had a again, I used that word earlier, chilling effect mm -hmm. on those who who practice this crap. Well, all right. So, how would you all react if we said, "All right, we're going to go to Congress and ask them to come up with a statute that um, will give us the necessary tools, but it'll be called something else"? Won't we'll use. The, All right, well, that's fine. I'm, I'm just talking about, we're just talking about the term espionage act here. Um, but if we went out and tried to, you know, reformulate the, uh, the statute using a less charged term, um, you know. And, and was it the department's position that reporters who obtained and published classified information were in violation of that act, espionage act? Well, you know, technically... Technically, that might be true, but, you know, what I said and what I meant was that no reporter um, who was doing their job was ever going to go to jail for doing their job. Judy Miller wouldn't have gone to, job, go, gone to jail if I was Attorney General of the United States. That wouldn't have happened, you know? It just wouldn't have happened. Um, and, yeah, technically, technically, but people technically break the law all the time, and prosecutors make decisions not to bring those cases for, you know, very valid reasons. Um, we have a great deal of power 
as prosecutors. And um, those who, are, who act reflexively um, without thoughts as to what the collateral impacts are or the use of, of that power are not good prosecutors. But technically, yeah, technically that's true. Yeah. How do we resolve this fundamental tension that most of us who cover law enforcement and or national security issues, our job is to try to figure out precisely as best we can what government is doing because we operate from the fundamental tenet that a government that operates in darkness sometimes does, does bad things and your desire to keep things secret. Yeah, I mean, there is that tension. Um, I mean, I'm a person who thinks that government needs to be as transparent as it can be. On the other hand, having worked in government at very high levels, there are a whole variety of things that um, government can only do um, in secret, you know? Um, things that I suspect we would all agree are necessary, um, to protect the nation, and secrecy has to be a part of that. Now, I'm also a person who thinks that at some point, you know, when you're, I don't know, 20 years, 30 years down the road from whatever the, the necessary secret was, that you ought to be disclosing things. You ought to be opening up files so that people can see what government was doing, you know, at some time. You know, the British have some, I forget what the statute, what the period of time is, where they basically kind of throw their files open. I think that's something that, you know, we ought to do, um, we ought to do as well. But um, there, is that, um, there is that tension um, where, but for the secrecy, um, we could not interact with or do the kinds of things that, um, as I said, everybody would, I think, pretty much agree that um, it, that was the function of government, you know, function of government to do. Final two questions. Uh, Attorney General Lynch. Uh, what assurances can you give us that she will continue to move forward with limiting and or eliminating the times when journalists are under pressure to reveal information about their sources? Uh, it would be hard for me to imagine. I, mean, I, I, I know Loretta. I've known her for you know, a bunch of years. and I, I think we share a worldview. So I think that in terms of, of her, um, I'd be shocked. And I, don't, I just don't even think it's even remotely possible that there'd be any retreating from the things that we you know, these reforms that we put in place. But I also think that because these reforms have occurred, uh, it would be difficult for any um, subsequent AG uh, or administration to turn their back on those reforms. Uh, I think that would be very, very, um, that would be a difficult thing to do. I mean, the reforms that we put in place were the first reforms, substantial reforms, I guess in the last, what, 20, 30 years or so, something like that. It had been some reforms 20, 30 years before. Um, and my guess is that um, having put those in place, um, they'd be hard to, to unwind. And that's and, a good thing, I think. And to wrap up, um, I guess my primary question is, how critical is dialogue between the press and government to, again, limiting intrusions against what we have to do to keep the American public informed? Well, I think it's absolutely critical, and that's why one of the reasons, one of the things that we put in place was that whole notion of having these periodic um, meetings so that the press would have the ability to um, share general concerns about the way things were going, specific concerns about any cases that might be of, uh, uh, of note, um, and so the government would have the ability also to share thoughts, concerns that uh, existed on, on that side. I mean, I think this, this dialogue is, I think the tension is in almost inevitable, but I think that is good if managed in an appropriate way. Um, but I think dialogue and the ability to meet and talk about things, um, and especially to have the ability to meet and talk about things when you're not in a crisis atmosphere, you know, when you're not dealing with, um, to the extent you're not dealing with a specific case that is, you know, a flashpoint, um, when you try to anticipate those kinds of things, I think that's when, um, in some ways, dialogue can be uh, the most productive. You know, and... There are a lot of people that think that that Fourth Circuit reverse in the Rising case is going to have long-term implications and damage on our ability to do our jobs. Uh, well, you know, what see, remedies and, do we have? See, and that was one of those other things. Where I looked, you know, again, you know, I'm an advocate, and I, I thought to myself, you know, 
really? Do you want to go there? Do you really want to appeal this thing? You know, do you want to take this up and set what it was clearly going to be a bad precedent? You know, now I, I understand. You know, a desire to try to um, win, um, you know, vindicate a, a, a position, but in the same way that prosecutors don't go after every technical violation of the law. I think, with all due respect, that with regard to um, how the defense, the opposition in, in that case, at some point I would have stopped, you know, out of fear that you're going to get the opinion that you did get, you know, that there's yet, yet another. You know, their counter would be that it was the department being aggressive. Well, you know, um, I think we were following what I think is clear law and no indication that the law was going to change. Um, and so to have a reiteration of, um, of that wasn't necessarily, you know, when we got past the fourth circuit, it wasn't necessarily a, a, a good thing. I guess we'll have to have a professional disagreement or the, uh, our industry will have to have a professional disagreement. I thank you for your time. And... Um, <laughs> Again, I just want to thank each and every one for coming uh, and supporting what we do. Uh, really, our only goal and our only desire is to try to protect those who uh, pursue the craft of journalism so that they can do it without fear and intimidation. And again, that's what our goal is. We thank you for coming. And I think Mr. Holder is going to stick around for a few minutes, um, you know, to answer individual questions.